Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Sit back, relax, and listen as we have a calm conversation on topics that you may find mundane, but I know a lot of our listeners do find some of the mundane topics I try to present as fascinating and interesting, so I will just give that as a precursor. Certainly, this would be one that I find fascinating, not just because of the subject matter, but because of my guest. I'm happy to welcome one of my dearest and oldest friends, and I hate to use oldest friends, but dearest indeed, Dr. Linda Mora to the podcast. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Marco. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, Linda, listen. First of all, I need to let my listeners know that I often will get texts from Linda with photos of me from high school and grade school, and those are always (laughs) funny and fun. And I should mention that you're a professor of Canadian and Indigenous uh, literature at one of Canada's uh, universities. And um, so we're going to be talking about that. But I did want to mention that you also have this playful uh, side to you that some people don't always see. (laughs) It's definitely there and it does extend back uh, several years. Yeah, I'm not sure also about the oldest, but uh, I have to say I really think our friendship is amazing, longstanding, and one that I seriously appreciate. I think we're not of, old. L- Neither yeah, you and you're I are. You're not, not I don't mean as in you're <laughs> the most ancient friend I have, because certainly I have ancient friends, people in their 80s and even 90s. Um, but you certainly are someone I've known for quite some time. So, Agreed. So, so I'll say that uh, since, since grade school anyways. Um, but we're both young. I'm going to say that as well. I want to talk about something that we share, a love for something we share, which is podcasting. And I guess I should, I'm not going to talk so much, Linda, but I'll just set it up. So I wrote a book on podcasting, thanks to this podcast that you're listening to called The Mm -hmm. Insomnia Project. The book is called 25 Things I Wish I Knew Before I Started My Podcast. And I reached out to Linda and she graciously accepted uh, the opportunity. I don't think it was an opportunity for you, but she accepted the fact of becoming the editor for the book. So I'm grateful to that because to have such a prestigious professor edit my book was 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 so lucky for me. It was such a pleasure. In fact, um, as you know, I, I was already interested in developing my own podcast. And so when you told me that you were looking to have it edited, I jumped on the opportunity because I thought this is an opportunity for me to learn, not just to edit. And I really did. I, I think it made the, the endeavor of starting or setting up my own podcast so much easier because of it. Well, I will say this. We have four podcasts that were created because of people that I know of that have read the book. So that's pretty, that to me is the biggest feather in the cap. And I only mention it because if you are thinking of starting a podcast and it's available in your library, I don't expect anyone to buy the book, but if it's available in your library, please go out and get it and see if you can get a kernel of of knowledge and hopefully you can join us in this space. And I say join us because Linda, you have a tremendous podcast that I want to talk about today. (laughs) So tell us about your podcast. Well, the, the title of the podcast is Getting Lit with Linda, and I'd like your listeners to know that, in fact, it was your collaboration with me which led to the title of that podcast. So I, I remember that when I was thinking about starting one, it was initially for the sake of my students, um, because we were in, in the middle of the pandemic, we were in the throes of trying to figure out new ways of teaching, and I thought a podcast would be a good, um, a good way of reaching my students. And so just at this time, you were finishing up your book and I pitched the idea to you. And then we got, we collaborated together on developing the title and the content. Now, the podcast is largely about literature and it focuses primarily on Canadian literature, but not exclusively so. Yes. So we sometimes look at, at authors who are um, international and so forth. But it is largely a weekly or bi-weekly, I should say, literary podcast. Um, and we it's a way of really appreciating, loving books, uh, understanding them as a source of comfort and diversion, 
um, expanding our frames of reference and so on. Well, Linda, you weave your some of your personal moments or personal yes. personal uh, personal things. I'm not. Even, I don't even know what I'm saying now. But like moments <laughs> in your life, I, I think I said personable, which yeah, makes no did. sense. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna make up words here. Um, <laughs> it's always good when you're speaking with a. Um, a I'm all of for that. To, I'm all for making sure. up new words. Absolutely. <laughs> but you know. To some, hearing that you do a literature podcast, they're they're going to be like, "Oh, this is this just sounds so not my thing or so boring." But you weave mm -hmm. a book that you talk about with personal moments in your life or things that you've encountered, and uh, yes. you do such a you you do such a justice to the author's work, in my opinion. And you've made me actually want to read books. That I wouldn't have never wanted to read. It's like, oh wow, this sounds really interesting. I'm like, oh, I should pick this up. Oh, I'm going to see if there's an audiobook on this. Oh, I'd like to record the audiobook version. I'm going to read this book, and then all of a sudden, I've got all these books that you're talking about in my in my cart. I'm really grateful to hear that. Of course. So I'll give you an example, just so that uh, the your listeners have a sense of what they might expect. In one episode that's not yet published, but will be out next week as an example, I look at Kai Kello's Magnetic Equator. Now, um, it's a collection of poetry, and, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, I, I can't see how a collection of poetry might bear on my life. Sure. But I start the episode really oddly with a reference to my father's espresso machine. That's wonderful. What, what can an espresso machine have yeah. to do with the collection of poetry? I explained that the espresso machine in this instance, um, I should I should add that my father passed away in 2019. Okay. And so he has this wonderful espresso machine, which reminds me of him, of having coffee together. And so every time I hear it, I have all of these wonderful, warm, evocative memories. And so I begin to discuss how sound in relation to memory has these positive implications. And that's what Kai Kello is doing. He looks at, among other things, how sound creates a kind of context for us, a home. Um, and so that's just one example oh, of wow. how I look at how personal anecdotes bear upon or um, might might connect us to the books that we're reading. Sure, sure. And if you wouldn't mind, let's take a walk down Espresso Machine Lane because <laughs> this is an important part of my life too. Um, now, the beauty of espresso machines or even the stovetop espresso makers is the longer you have them and the more you use them, yes. the better the espresso that comes from it. Is yes. that true with your father's espresso machine that I believe you now have, right? It's a... It's a um... A highly irregular machine. Let's just put it that way. So, sure, it had it's malfunctioned several times. <laughs> but my my partner, who is absolutely amazing with electronic hardware and so forth, has I've come back to find the machine completely taken apart and disemboweled. Oh, wow. And I'm thinking I'll never see another espresso from that machine again. And then he miraculously puts it back together. Wow. And so it's an old machine, absolutely reliable. It makes the best espresso, which I is bet. why we are so stubborn um, and persistent about about uh, trying to fix it every time it breaks down. But it's still it's still going strong, still giving us espresso. Listen, I'm not going to get off this topic that quick. Tell me about your <laughs> espresso day. So, like, when do you first? I'll tell you that my espresso day starts in the morning. In that I have a cappuccino, so I make my espresso, and then I may froth my milk, and one, they meet together and shake hands, and then they end up in my belly, and everyone is happy with this with this arrangement. What is your espresso? And that's the first espresso. And then I have what I call my afternoon espresso, which is around two or three o'clock. Exactly. And a lot of friends point out maybe if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have insomnia, Marco. But I'm not willing to give it up. So, and that one I just have espresso, and I pour cold milk directly into it. And depending on how I feel, if I need a little sweetness in my life, sugar or a reasonable facsimile like xylitol might appear in that. Oh, yeah. Xylitol is excellent. So that's yes. my that's my espresso journey, journey, generally speaking. I need to know what yours is. Yeah, I don't function in the morning without that first espresso. And it, it's a, in Montreal, we call them when you make them a little longer, allongé, an espresso, oh, wow. espresso allongé. 
So, um, it's, which is different in Italian. You wouldn't do it quite that way. Well, you could say a lungo, an espresso lungo. A lungo, right? that's right, an espresso right. lungo, right? No, so in Montreal, if you go into a cafe and you ask for an espresso allongé, they'll know exactly what you're asking for. They're a little bit longer. Yes. They're not an espresso americano where they add hot water, which is just... The worst. The worst. I don't know why anyone would drink that. I have a dear friend of mine, Trevor, who's been on the show, who loves who loves a, loves an americano. And I'm like, I can't <sighs> even like... I can't, no. It, it, my body rejects it. I'm like, I can't drink this. And I know there's a lot of listeners who are saying right now, I, I really hate Marco and Linda because I love an Amer- American. We're wrong headed to them. I, I respect. Listen, if you if that's the way you like coffee, then that's the way you should have it. It just doesn't work for me. It, it yeah. just it doesn't work for me. And I'm glad to know that it doesn't work for you, Linda, because. No, not at all. Yeah. So, you no, know, I'll have that espresso a mm-hmm. uh, And it, what that means is that it that it's run through the machine a little longer. So right. you're still getting some of that that hit of coffee, it's just slightly longer. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll add a dash of, just a small dash of cream, a little bit of sugar, and a hit of cinnamon, which I really like. And that gets me in the morning, and then a little bit later in the afternoon, I'll have a second one, and possibly a third, and that one will be a a short espresso. Yes. No no cream, a little bit of sugar, Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. The the key thing here always is the beans, that I grind my own beans. You grind your own beans. Oh, yeah. I'm very fussy about that. I don't because I haven't been able to find the right grind for me. And I find if I, Mm. if I don't do it right, the coffee could upset me a bit, but I will say this with regards to cinnamon. Have you ever taken a a teensy bit of cinnamon and put it on the grounds in the machine? No. Oh, I will try that. The secret is go very light with the cinnamon, because if you put too much cinnamon, cinnamon can sort of. Uh, coagulate like it can it can gl- yes. gum up it could become gummy and it could gum up your machine but if you just do the tiniest little sprinkle of cinnamon on the grounds as the hot water goes through it it will really pick up that cinnamon um, essence in your actual coffee versus on top of it give it a try i had no idea that's yeah. a great suggestion yeah. thank you so much no i i didn't know that one could do that yeah thank well, you Leaving Espresso Machine Lane, I'm going to take you back to uh, your life as an author, too. I want to say congratulations because you recently won the Gabriel Ra- Ro- Roy Ro- 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 Prize. I'm sure the Gabriel, the Gabriel Roy Prize. Thank you. I'm sure he's really happy with my mispronunciation. She. Oh, she. Okay. So I'm just, okay. How about I just leave it up to you, Linda, because I've just made a mess of that whole segment. I will say this. Um, you won it for your book, Moving Archives. Yes, exactly. Yes, thank you, Marco. So the Gabriel Wa Prize in English is awarded to um, one book nationally for outstanding Canadian literary criticism. And it's, it's a collection with about eight contributors. I was the chief editor, and I also contributed a chapter. Amazing. So, yeah, I was really, I, we were all, all the contributors were just elated. It was announced about two days ago. So, um, yeah, so that book is uh, being recognized as such, yes. As as it is well-deserved. I apologize, Gabrielle. And I even wrote it out phonetically, Linda, I'll show you the page, <laughs> and I still didn't say it right. So that bad is on me. But going back to the podcast. Yes. What have you found about podcasting that you didn't know prior to becoming a podcaster that you really enjoy? A couple of things. So usually when I put together a lecture for students, the format is slightly different. Um, I go in with a set of questions that I want the students to entertain, and it's a little more, it's more of an engaged conversation. I still have at least... I would say 40 minutes to an hour straight of lecture notes. But I think it's important in the classroom setting to really engage the students. Podcasting is not, I mean, I am engaging listeners, but it's not, uh, it doesn't work in the same kind of immediate fashion. I'm putting together what I see as a kind of 20 minute um, examination of a literary text, but it's also personal. Sure. The fact that I start with an anecdote, it means that I'm trying to reach a different kind of audience to infuse them with a sense of love and passion about particular books and to see um, and to explain rather to people how they're relevant to their everyday lives. That's a very different thing from what I'm doing in the classroom. And I've learned to love and approach the books I habitually love in a completely different way. 
Would you say that Linda Mora, the podcaster, is much more likable than Linda Mora, the person in front of the classroom? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm I, I suppose. <laughs> no, it's okay. I suppose some of the students might agree and think, oh, she's just not likable at all. But generally, the students do love me too, okay. and I love them. We have a really great rapport, largely. There are always exceptions, and I'm sure there are listeners who feel the same. Sure. But my attitude is the same. I, I want us, I feel like getting lit with Linda is timely and that I want people to feel a sense of comfort and solace and love and connection Sure. in a, in a world that has been recently increasingly fragmented and tumultuous. I think this offers a little bit of respite. It's a wonderful escape. And if you don't have time to read books, but you love to read books then I say, I, I invite you to listen to Getting Lit with Linda. Now, I asked you, Linda, what you learned and what, what you found that podcasting brought to you. Let me ask you the same question with regards to Canadian literature. What is it about Canadian literature that resonates with you? That's a really good question. Every once in a while, Linda, I get one out there. <laughs> Your your other questions were also really good. That one is, sure, sure, is, sure. <laughs> is, a, little, is a little more provocative for me. I mean, why not Victorian literature? Why not 19th century right. British? The thing about Canadian literature is that it allows me to explore a wider range of ideas. So I, in fact, I did study uh, 19th century literature, Renaissance literature. I do have a background in British literature, but it's very narrow in its focus, whereas Canadian engages with recent contemporary concerns in a way that I had yet to see in British literature. The other thing is, as I, just as I finished my PhD in Canadian literature, I, I encountered for the first time Indigenous literature, which is not the same thing. People right. often conflate the two as if they're the same fields, but they're not. And so I had this wonderful sense of encountering an entirely new and exciting body of work. And I, I feel that my field has allowed for that. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, I, what I found fascinating about what you said there is that it allows you a wider range of experience. And mm. one would think you're Canadian and mm. you are a professor of Canadian literature. Why would the literature of your nation allow you a wider range of experiences or connection than, say, foreign literature, foreign mm -hmm. to you, that is, not non-Canadian mm. literature? I just find that fascinating. Well, it's... <sighs> It's not that American literature doesn't do the same thing. It really does. Sure, of course it does. Um, because there are more contemporary bodies mm -hmm. of literature. So they, um, they introduce us or invite us to engage with all of those contemporary issues they, that, that we're reading about in the papers and to engage with them in meaningful ways. And I, I think it was that that really fascinated me. It wasn't always that way. When I started um, with Canadian literature, I, I actually began with Emily Carr, who was an artist and right. a writer. I, did, I people... didn't know she was a writer. I know her, mm. her artwork is fantastic. If I'm not mistaken, it's a very um, West Coast. It has a very West Coast uh, mm. feel to it, right? It, it's true. She's mm. considered a West Coast artist okay. largely, and people often forget that she's also a writer. Right. She's someone who's a highly contentious figure too, though, because she's seen as appropriating Indigenous iconography for right. both of her painting and her writing. That said, I, I've done extensive studies of her literary work. So let me just add there that she won the Governor General's Award in 1941, one of the first. The, we have to remember that the GGs were established in 1936. And so for won. our international and American audience, the Governor General is a uh, literary prize, is a, is a very high prize for literature in our country. It's one of two, really. Okay. There's the, the Giller Prize, and I would say three, actually. Okay. But for literature or fiction in particular, the Giller Prize and the Governor General's Awards are the main two. Sure. Uh, they come with lucrative, it's a lucrative prize, and it comes with all kinds of extra distinction attached. But um, it, the Governor General's Awards were established in 1936, and they're still going strong. Right. In 41, Carr wins for her first book called Clee Wick. Uh, it's a name that she appropriates for herself to, in some ways, legitimate her entry into Indigenous communities, and in particular, the Nuta North. So she, 
she's someone for these reasons who has a kind of uh, dubious status, but she really is an exceptional writer in some ways, even insofar as her, she has these biases in her writing toward the indigenous and they're very apparent. Right. Um, and would be deemed highly inappropriate now. Sure. That said, as I say, she's someone who served as an entry point for me into Canadian literature. So I began to be aware of those conversations because of her. I became aware of the fact that that she had somehow um, that she somehow allowed me to access different conversational points and debates about Indigenous and Canadian literature. I see. And Linda, you also wrote a book about um, Emily Carr's letters, right? Or yes, the back and yes. forth. I wanted to mention that as well. What is the name of that book in case anyone wants? I should have wrote, I wrote it down here. No, that's all right. It's uh, it's called Corresponding Influence. And it's about the letters exchanged between Emily Carr and her then editor, Ira Dilworth. Ira, D- Ira Dilworth was a um, regional director for CBC Radio at the time. He went on to serve as the international superintendent of... Um, of CBC Radio oh, wow. at a later date in his career. But at that time, he was a former professor of Victoria University and recognized the merits of her writing. So he did something that I conceive of now as highly unusual. Okay. He kept all of her letters. She kept his, but he didn't keep any of his letters for the rest of his career around oh. CBC. Oh, isn't that interesting? It showed. Uh, it shows us what he what he was valuing in the period. One could say that's why archiving is so important, Linda. One could say, one not only could say, one should say. (laughs) And that brings me to Moving Archives, uh, the book that you won the Gabrielle Oa Prize in. I'm sure I said the name wrong. I apologize once again. Um, No, you you got it right. Okay. Uh, And we did an episode on moving. I did an episode with you on moving archives, but... uh, only our patrons on Patreon listen to that episode, so I will bring it forward since it is timely with your award, and I'll let our Thank regular you. listeners or the listeners who listen to podcasts, wherever they listen to podcasts, hear that episode because it was a brilliant episode. Not because I did it, but because you were <laughs> the guest. Um, so how can one, an ordinary person, keep archives? Well, different ways now. Okay. So increasingly, the, that's one of the points uh, or one of the observations of the book that the the form the the forms that archives assume have radically altered and therefore the way that we approach preserve and talk about archives that has also radically altered sure um so with the increasing use of digital forms we have to ask ourselves how much will be retained right are we going to keep all of our email what about twitter what about facebook all of that activity we may not personally keep, we should know that Facebook keeps everything. They right. have something like five or six massive warehouses where they're keeping all of this data about us. And that is an archive, but an sure. archive that is not really within our grasp or control. Of course. But we can, as individuals, when we think we have something of value, um, we can we can use different means or ways to preserve those documents. So, for example... For any documents that I think of as having a legacy beyond my life, I actually purchase special archive boxes. They are oh. acid-free. And so for I have a letter from Jane Rule. I have a postcard from Phyllis Webb to Jane Rule. These are major writers in the field of Canadian literature, and I want to make sure that they are preserved beyond my life. And of so course. that's where they are with instructions to leave them with an archive. Amazing. I hope there's a picture of you and me at the prom in that <laughs> archival box, because I think that would be really, really key for people in oh, the future. Oh, I'll be sure of it. <laughs> Linda, I wanted to ask you this. So um, this is an experience with an author that I loved. So I don't know if you know Bill Bryson. He's a uh, American or a British American or an American British author because now he lives in England who writes about many things, but uh, a lot of his literature dealt with travel and Hmm. it's a comedic look at travel. And I showed up for jury duty once and I was waiting in the jury area and I was reading his book and I started to burst out laughing uncontrollably. (laughs) So everyone would look at me like, 
is this person okay? Like he's just spontaneously erupting into a lot of laughter. Needless to say, they didn't pick me for ju- jury duty <laughs> because I was <laughs> spontaneously laughing. They didn't realize that the book I was reading, I found very humorous. Has there been a book or an author that has made you spontaneously laugh out loud? Because I feel like we had a very serious discussion on various aspects of literature, but I know that you agree that literature can also be fun and hilarious and heartwarming and just take you to places that like no other medium can oh yes well one of the most recent books uh, not to pander to you marco but to pander to you was was your book oh really Um, yes yeah 25 things i wish i knew before i started my podcast it was one of the one of the books that had me laughing out loud at, at several junctures i i it was helpful in establishing getting lit with linda so for that, for its practical advice, I recommend it. But it was also so much fun. Okay. I really enjoyed reading it. Okay. Besides my brilliance, though, <laughs> thank you for that, by the way. Uh, but no, is there an author that makes you laugh that you're like, this person just warms? And it could be, even be a comic book author because, you know, I've got collections of comics that make me laugh. But I'm just curious to, to dive into what makes you laugh. Yeah, there are there are Canadian authors who have done that, but the the one book that comes to mind that it's not a, a Canadian book, it's an American book, is Juno Diaz's This Is How You Lose Her. Okay. The title gives it away, This Is How You Lose Her. It's about his, extre- uh, well, the protagonist's extremely clumsy, um, at times extremely embarrassing attempts um, at his relationships. And so I mean, Juno Diaz has had some fairly controversial things happen around his own personal life. Okay. But if we, if we set that aside, the book itself, the, it's a collection of short stories, is delightful. I've, I, well, delightful, provocative, interesting. The students, I find, I've taught his uh, work in my class, and the students really engage with the book. And that's a clue about how, uh, how, how to approach that book. So the other story that comes to mind is uh, one that's found in Fidelity by Michael Redhill. Michael Redhill is a phenomenal writer. I think he last won a prize for Bellevue Square. He's a really sharp, funny, ironic, witty writer. So I would recommend Michael Redhill. Fantastic. Well, Linda, thank you so much. Before we go, I'm sure some of our listeners who have listened this far are thinking, what's the third great Canadian literary prize out there because you said there were three and it's Marco and Linda think this book is good prize. No, uh, Linda, what is the, what is the third uh, prize? Cause you mentioned three and I only know the Giller and the uh, governor general. So this is going to be news to me too. Well, there's also the Charles Taylor prize. Okay. So I was thinking about that, but I was also thinking of the um, CBC reads contest. Oh, of course. Canada reads. Yeah. Yeah. The Canada reads contest with its short list of authors every year. It really brings a lot of attention the author sales uh, increase exponentially once they've been shortlisted for that. So that's also um, a really amazing kind of uh, award system, if you will. Well, there you go. Linda, one great celebration of books is your podcast, Getting Lit with Linda. And you can find that anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I know that your season, you've already picked the books and you're already, you know, developing the episodes. But if listeners have a suggestion, where can they contact oh, yes. you? Please, they should contact me at gettinglitwithlinda at gmail.com. And I do want to hear from them. I'd, I'd be happy to take recommendations. And again, that's at gettinglitwithlinda at gmail.com. And you'll find it in our show notes as well, in case you are in bed and you didn't get a chance to write that down. So don't you worry. I will have them available for you. Until next time, Linda, thank you so much for being a part of this particular episode on the Insomnia Project. Thank you, Marco. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. My goodness. And I'm interviewing Linda from my studio in Toronto. She's in her studio in Montreal. And we hope you were able to listen and sleep.